the kingdom of my divine will in the midst of creatures book of heaven volume 32 part 10 september 17 1932 how the divine will is the motor and the assailer giving life calling back to life and making the memory of everything arise divine encampment how the motion of the divine will forms its life in the creature i am under the eternal waves of the divine volition and it seems to me that it wants me to pay attention to these waves to recognize them to receive them into myself to love them so as to say to me i am the eternal volition who is over you surrounding you everywhere investing your motion your breath your heartbeat to make it my own to make my way through it and so be able to extend my life in you i am the immense one who wants to restrict itself within the human littleness. I am the powerful one who delights in forming its life in the created weakness. I am the holy one who wants to sanctify everything. Pay attention to me and you will see what I can do and what I will do in your soul. But while my mind was all occupied with the divine volition, my always lovable Jesus, repeating his short little visit, told me, My blessed daughter, my will is the motor, which, with iron constancy, assails the creature from all sides, inside and out, to have her for itself, and make the great prodigy of forming its divine life in the creature. It can be said that it created her in order to form and repeat its life within her, and at any cost it wants to achieve the intent, and in all things it revolves around her, and seems to tell her, Look at me. It is I. Get to know me. I come to form my life in you. And acting as the assailer of the creature, it assails her inside and out, in such a way that whoever pays attention to it feels my divine will overflowing inside and outside of herself forming the prodigy of its divine life, such that she is unable to resist its power. And do you know what this divine will of mine does? It gives life. It calls everything back to life. And in this life, it makes arise everything it did and all the good that all creatures have done in kindling the sweet memory of its works, as though present and in act, as if it were repeating them. Nothing can escape this life, and one feels the fullness of everything, and oh, how happy, rich, powerful, holy the creature feels. She feels the endowment of all the good acts of others, and for everything she loves and glorifies the divine fiat as if they were her own. And my volition feels its own works being returned to it by her. And so the love, the glory of its divine works and through the remembrance 
it feels, being repeated, the glory and the love of the other creatures. Oh, how many works put into oblivion! How many sacrifices! How many heroic acts forgotten! which were done by the human generations, and to which no one gives a thought any more. And therefore there is neither the continuous repetition of the glory, nor anyone who would renew the love of those acts. And my divine will, forming its life in the human littleness, makes the memory of everything arise in order to give and receive everything. It centralizes everything in her and forms its divine encampment. Therefore, be attentive to receive these waves of my volition. They pour upon you to change your destiny. And if you receive them, you shall be its fortunate creature. After this, I continued to think about the divine will, and I thought to myself, but how can this divine life form in the soul? And my sweet Jesus added, My daughter, the human life is composed of soul, of body, of members, one distinct from the other. But who is the primary motion of this life? The will. So, without it, the creature would not be able to do beautiful works, or acquire knowledge, or be capable of teaching them. Therefore, all the beauty of life would disappear from the creature. And if she possesses beauty, quality, value, ingenuity, it must be attributed to the motion of order that the will possesses over the human life. Now, if this motion of order is assumed by my divine will over the creature, it forms the divine life inside of her. So, as long as the creature submits herself to receiving the motion of order of my will, inside and outside of herself, as prime motion of all her acts, this divine life of mine is already formed and takes its royal place in the depth of the soul. Motion says life, and if the motion originates from a human will, it can be called human life. If, on the other hand, the origin is my will, it can be called divine life. See how easy it is to form this life, as long as the creature wants it. I do not want, nor do I ever ask for impossible things from the creature. But rather, first, I facilitate it. I render it adaptable, feasible, and then I ask for it. And while asking for it, in order to be more sure that she can do what I want, I offer myself to doing what I want her to do together with her. I can say that I place myself at her disposal, that she may find strength, light, grace, sanctity, not human, but divine. I do not look at what I give or what I do. When the creature does what I want, I abound so much with her as to let her feel 
not the weight, but the happiness of the sacrifice, which my divine will knows how to give. And just as the human life has its life, its distinct members, its qualities, so does my Supreme Being have its qualities most pure, not material, because matter does not exist in us, which form our life. United together, sanctity, power, love, light, goodness, wisdom, all-seeingness of everything, immensity, and so forth, form our divine life. But who constitutes the motion? Who is it that rules and unfolds all our divine qualities with an incessant and eternal motion? Our will. Our will is the motor, the director, which gives to each of our qualities the operating life. So if it wasn't for our will, our power would be without exercise, our love without loving, and so with all the rest. See then how everything is in the will, and this is why by giving it to the creature, we give everything. And since they are our little images, created by us, our own breaths, the little sparks of love spread by us in the whole creation, this is why we gave them a free will, united to ours, to form our facsimiles, wanted by us. There is nothing that glorifies us more, that loves us more, that makes us content than finding our own life, our image, our will in our work, created by us. Therefore we entrust everything to the power of our fiat to obtain the intent My daughter, you must know that both in our divinity, in the supernatural order, and in the natural order of the creatures, there is a virtue in nature, an innate prerogative of wanting to produce life, images that are like oneself, and therefore a yearning of love an ardent desire to pour oneself into the life and work that one produces. In all creation, there is nothing that does not resemble us. The heavens resemble us in immensity, and the stars in the multiplicity of our joys and infinite beatitudes. In the sun, there is the likeness of our light. In the air, the likeness of our life that gives itself to all, belongs to all, and no one can escape it, even if one wanted to. In the wind which, while it makes itself felt, now with might, now, as though sweetly caressing the creatures and all things, yet they do not see it, our power and all-seeingness, for we see everything, hear everything, and enclose everything as though in the palm of our hand, yet they do not see us. In sum, there is nothing which does not carry a likeness to us. All our works give of us. Sing our praises. 
and each one has the office of making known each quality of their creator. Now, in man, it was not just a work that we were making, but human life and divine life that we created in him. Therefore, we yearn, we want, we long to reproduce in him our life and image. We reach the point of drowning him with love, and when he does not let himself be drowned, because he is free in himself, we reach the point of persecuting him with love, letting him find no peace in anything that escapes from us. Not finding ourselves in him, we wage incessant war against him because we want our image beautiful, our life reproduced in him. And since all things are made and grafted by us, also in the natural order, there is this virtue of wanting to produce similar things and life. See, a mother generates a baby. All her yearnings and desires are that she wants him similar to herself, and she longs to see him born to the light, similar to his parents. And if the baby resembles them, oh, how happy they are! They make of him their boast. They want to show him to everybody. They raise him with their habits, their own way. In sum, this child becomes their preoccupation and their glory. But if, on the other hand, he is dissimilar to his parents, ugly, deformed. Oh, how embittered they remain, tormented. And they reach the point of saying with highest sorrow, It seems as if he is not our child, one from our own blood. They would almost want to hide him, to let no one see him feeling humiliated and confounded. And this child shall be the torture of his parents for all their lives. All things possess the virtue of reproducing things similar to themselves. The seed produces another seed, the flower another flower, the bird another little bird, and so with all the rest. Not to produce similar things is to go against nature, divine and human. Therefore, not to have the creature similar to us is one of our greatest sorrows, and only one who lives of our will shall be able to be our joy and bearer of glory and of triumph for our creative work. Fiat September 24th, 1933 The Humanity of Our Lord Sacrarium and Custodian of All the Works of the Creatures How Love Never says enough. My abandonment in the fiat continues, nor can I help feeling the murmuring of its life. Not to feel its murmuring would be like not having life any more. A murmuring that murmurs and gives light, murmurs and fortifies, murmurs and makes you feel its life that warms you and transforms you into its own. Divine will, how lovable, admirable you are! How not to love you! Then I was following its works, and as I followed them, 
So they poured upon me to give me love and tell me, We are works of yours made for you. Take us, possess us, and make us your own, so that in whatever you do, you might have ready the model of our own. And while I was following the works of redemption, my sweet Jesus, making me pause, told me, My good daughter, in all our works, there was always an excess of love toward man, and one excess gave me the spur to make another one. So it was not enough for me to descend from heaven to earth in order to make him anew. But each act I did, each pain, and I can say even each breath, was directed toward him. In my all-seeingness, I called him. I clasped him in my arms. I molded him anew in order to restore him and give him the new life, which I had brought for him from heaven. I made him my own brother in order to place him in the sonship of my celestial father. But this was not enough for me. In order to keep him more safe, I made of my humanity the depository of all the works, sacrifices, and steps of man. Look at me, how I hold everything enclosed within me. And this leads me to love him twice as much in each act he does. By incarnating myself in the womb of the Immaculate Queen, I formed this humanity of mine, and I constituted myself the head of the human family in order to unify all creatures with me and make them my own members. Therefore, everything they do is mine. I enclose everything in the sacrarium of my holy humanity. I keep the little good as well as the great. But do you know why? By their passing into me, I give them the value as if they were my own works, prayers, and sacrifices. The virtue of the head descends into the members blending everything together. And I give them the value of my own merits. So the creature finds herself in me, and I, as the head, find myself in them. But do you think that my love said or says enough? Ah, no, it will never say enough. The nature of divine love is to form ever new inventions of love, to give love and receive love. If it were not so, it would be like setting a limit and closing our love within our divine sphere. But no, our love is immense, and by its own nature must always love. And here is why I want my humanity to be followed by the large field of my divine will, which will do incredible things for love of creatures. Here, then, its knowledge is, it's wanting to reign. If it does not reign, how can it abound and make display of its surprises of love? Therefore, be attentive, and you will see what my will can do. Fiat October 1st, 1933 Enchanting scenes which Jesus enjoys in the soul who lives in his will.
continuous calling of God and the creature. The divine volition never leaves me. It seems to me that it remains always inside and outside of me, as though an act of surprising me, for it wants to place its act in everything I do, whether I pray, I suffer, I work, and even if I sleep, it wants to give me its divine rest in my sleep. It wants to always keep busy, and in each thing, it calls me by saying to me, Let me descend unto the lowness of your acts, and I shall make you ascend up to the highness of mine, and we will start a contest, you in ascending, I in descending. But who can say what the divine will makes me feel in my soul? It's excessive love, it's magnanimity, it's continuous keeping busy over my poor soul. But while I was under the empire of the divine volition, as it poured itself upon me, my highest good, Jesus, surprising me, told me, My good daughter, there is no scene that moves me and enraptures me more than seeing the human littleness under the empire of my will. The divine within the human, the great inside the littleness, the strong in the weak, one hiding within the other, conquering each other. It is so beautiful, so enchanting, that I find the pure joys, the divine happiness, that the creature can give me though I see that it is my own will that secretly offers it to me, and it hands it to me through the channel of the human will. If you knew how much I delight, you would always let yourself be conquered by my will in order to please me. I can say that I leave heaven, though I remain there, to come and enjoy the pure joys that my divine will is able to give me within the little circle of the creature on earth. You must know that one who does my divine will and allows its life to flow within her acts, continuously calls God and all his attributes, and God feels constantly called by the creature. Now she calls him for she wants his power. Now because she wants his love. Now because she wants his sanctity, his light, his goodness, his imperturbable peace. In sum, she calls him constantly for she wants of his own. God is always there waiting for her to give her what she asks for. And in order to requite her, he feels called, and he calls her to give her confidence and say to her, What else do you want of my divine being? Take whatever you want, or rather, as you call me, I already prepare for you my power, my love, my light, my sanctity, which are needed in your act. So God calls the soul, and the soul calls God, and this continuous calling of each other in order to ask and receive, and for God to give forms the life of my will in the creature, matures it, makes it grow, and forms the sweet enchantment of her very creator. A continued act encloses such power that God cannot unbind himself from the creature, 
nor can she from God. On the contrary, they feel the irresistible need to remain clasped to each other. And only my will knows how to produce these continuous acts that never cease and form the true character of the living in my will. On the other hand, a mutable character, a fragmented operating, is the true sign of the living of human volition, which knows not how to give either firmness or peace, and is capable of producing nothing but thorns and bitternesses. Fiat. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 32, Part 10. Fiat.